Facing a possible second prison sentence, Angelica decided to flee the state of Iowa, leaving her son Anthony with her mother. Angelica expected to go back to prison eventually. What she hadn't expected was a trap. From Rivet and Streetwise, this is where I stay. The deconstruction has begun. Time for me to fall apart. I'm Jesse Patend. This episode, the Iowa court system says Angelica abandoned her son and begins the process of permanently terminating her parental rights. Episode 7, The Bugs Between Your Teeth. And break apart. I'll break apart. Location, Mitchellville Correctional Facility. Again. All I did was just read. Majority of the time I stayed inside and I just stayed reading. And is Christina still there? Mm, and they're all still there. Christina was a grade school classmate convicted of murder. Angelica had reconnected with her during her first visit to Mitchellville Prison just over a year ago. I'd come outside and have a cigarette or I'd go into the cafeteria, get food. But majority of the time it was spent inside. And they know what's going on? No. No, you're not even talking to them about it? Mm-mm. Wow. In prison, you don't really talk about your business. A public defender represented Angelica at her hearing. But their job was to defend her against the crime of breaking parole. After she was whisked away to prison, so was free access to an attorney. While all of this is going on, do you have anybody that you can talk to about no. how this is? No. No. During this whole process, as far as my son, there was no counseling. There was nobody that sat down and talked to me about what was going on and why I didn't have my son or what did I want to happen or anything else. The state of Iowa does provide free representation for some civil cases, including custody battles. So Angelica could have asked for free legal advice, but she didn't know where to start or whom to ask. I was told these are my options and that's, I have to pick one. That's it. Weeks turned into months. Still, Angelica heard nothing about her son, Anthony. About two months later, between two and three months later, uh, one of the COs had called me into the warden's office. I went into the warden's office, and it was a phone call um, letting, informing me that my mother was going to put my son up for adoption. She felt she was too old to be raising somebody else's kid. So my cousin was calling from Columbus, Ohio, to see would I... I'd be okay with her having an interstate compact, which would allow him to get, be removed from Iowa, take him to Ohio, where my cousin would be able to adopt him. I was like, hell yeah. What were you feeling when you found that out? Uh, mad, but you can't do anything. Yeah. And stuff either you get mad and who you gonna hit. The person you want to hit, which technically would have been my mother, <laughs> was not available. And then I go into the hole and I get more time added to my sentence. That's not what I want either. Mm-hmm. You just sit there and you look dumb. You know, you can't cry because then other people think you're a weak piece of shit and stuff. Now they want to pick on you because they know you're going to cry. You're a crybaby. They're going to take advantage of it. So you can't do that. So it's like you're catch a, in a rock and a hard place. You can't go left and you can't go right. Yeah. And stuff. So I'm like, I can't believe the anger built up real quick. Like, this bitch, how the fuck? I knew she had it in for me. She didn't like me since I was 12. She don't like me now. Fuck her. Fuck everything that she represents. The next few weeks were tense. Angelica couldn't get in touch with her mother, and her cousin didn't have any updates. 
Mixed with her anger, though, was a shred of hope. If her cousin adopted Anthony, maybe Angelica could get him back. The staff tried to reassure her. They're like, don't worry about it. You have a short term. Re- you know, calm down, whatever. She was only three months into what would end up being a year-long sentence. But I guess everything's relative. Angelica read and waited to be released. So when I go get out of prison, I move back out to the West Coast. Angelica was released in late 2004. At the time, she was 24. Her son was five. She still hadn't heard anything about her cousin adopting her son. She didn't know if her mother had changed her mind or if things were just moving slowly. But she still saw this odd chain of adoptive custody as her last avenue to becoming his mother again. In the meantime, she decided to return to the one part of her life that had felt like it was going well. I go back into the whole prostitution thing. Before she went back to prison for breaking parole, Angelica had worked with a network of pimps and sex workers across Las Vegas, California, and Arizona. Angelica went back to Vegas and picked up where she left off. I was not wearing the same clothes twice. That was like a taboo. I would wake up in the morning and come down to the malls or go on Madison off of Madison and Pulaski and get me a whole outfit with the shoes. Yeah. I was 25 and had a Mercedes CL K500 that was valued at 125000 One night while driving her Mercedes, Angelica says a police officer stopped her. He was like, uh, is this your vehicle? I'm like, yeah. He's like, is your name registered to it? So I got out the car. By that time, I was a smart ass and stuff. And I was like, why are you stop? Why, why are you questioning about my car? And he's like, are you sure this is your car? I said, oh, I understand. It hurts your feelings to know that I'm 25 and have a car that you've been working for 25 years and still can't get and stuff. And then the officer was like, you have a nice day. I was like, you do the same. I got back in my car and we left. I was an asshole. On her trips back to Chicago to visit her dad, Angelica came back ready to splurge. I got to the point where I would go in there and I'd buy the same shoe in five different colors. Salespeople knew her on site. He was like, here's the book. Whatever shoe you see, circle it. I'll order it for you. And he would call me and be like, your shoes are here. After I wore the outfit once, I'd give them to my play sisters and stuff. And they would wear my shoes, my clothes, because they knew I wasn't never going to wear it again. One night in Arizona... Everything changed. So at that time, I was living in Las Vegas, but we had property in um, in Arizona. Location, a hotel in the desert. So I had went to Arizona to pick up some money as far as the properties went and um, handle a couple minor business issues over there. The plan was to handle her business and then stay in Arizona for the night before heading back. So... I ended up going to a hotel on 24th Street in Indian School. And I parked my car, and I was in a convertible at that time. So I had got out the car. Um, I was in a little black dress and stuff, strapless dress and stuff that thought I was looking cute. And I parked next to a white van. I'll never forget the white van. Blue interior, baby shoes hanging off the rearview mirror, and mm. ladders on top. It was like a, a work van. So it's like 9 o'clock at night, between 9 and 10. And so in Arizona, it's still 100 degrees weather. I had seen two Hispanic men sitting on the stairwell instead of drinking beers. I, I didn't pay no mind. I ended up going into the hotel room instead of the doors were on the outside. So I went into the hotel room. I had packages. So I put my packages down. I'm like, okay, now I got to go back outside to close the convertible. So when I opened the hotel door, um, one of the guys that were sitting on the stairs was at my door. So when I opened the door, I was like, what the hell? And he stabbed me in my throat. He took the knife and just jabbed me in my throat. 
So that made me back up into the hotel room like, what the fuck <sighs> just happened? He ended up coming into the hotel room. Me and him got to tussling one another. I remember being face down on the bed. Now, remind you, I had really long hair. I had hair past my butt at okay. this time. Um, so I remember being face down. I don't remember any of the other cuts after that first one because my adrenaline had already kicked in. So um, in my pocket, I had pepper spray. She managed to pull the pepper spray out of her purse and started firing it behind her. Between the blood and hair in her eyes, she could barely tell if she'd connected. And he backed up, I guess, from the fumes rather than in his eyes. He took a look at me and ran out of the room. I slammed the door. She locked the door behind him, her adrenaline pulsing. So I go into the bathroom area and stuff, and um, the left side of my face is drooping <gasps> like Night of the Living Dead. You know how when you oh. see the movies and stuff and their faces like just flapped over? That's oh. how my face was. The man ended up slitting my wrist twice. He stabbed me in my hand. Of course, the one in my throat. Um, he cut my forearm. That's why I have slashes there. And he cut me from my eye to behind my ear. So all of this, all of my left side of the face was drooping. I was bleeding from every part. Um, I ended up taking the towels, wrapping my throat, wrapping my hand and my wrist, and then taking another towel and wrapping my face. Looking out the window, I didn't see him. I opened the door. Angelica rushes to her car. It's still unlocked. She opens the door, gets in, and starts driving. I stop at the gas station, which is right there on the corner, and the man at, in the booth was like, let me call you an ambulance. And I'm like, no, just give me my fucking gas. I'm, I'm pumped up now. And so I'm like, just give me my fucking gas. Just give me my fucking gas. Where were you going? I was going to go to the emergency okay, room. Okay. The attendant ignores her instructions and starts calling an ambulance. So Angelica starts pumping gas. He called the ambulance. But by the time the ambulance came, I had already left. <sighs> so I drove myself to the hospital. When she gets to the hospital, the police are already there. They were like, what happened? Wanting, you know, to know what the situation was and everything else. Um, I had money in my purse. The man never took my purse. While the police start working through the story, Angelica is brought into surgery. They sewed my hand, my wrist, and my throat at that hospital. And then um, they didn't have a plastic surgeon on, on duty. So they ended up having to transfer me to another hospital. While Angelica was being transferred, news of what had happened passed through her circles. Word had came out that I had my face and everything had got slashed because a girl that was working the strip right there told her pimp and her pimp ended up letting other people know, which ended up going getting back to mine. And um, my pimp's brother ended up meeting me at the hospital and stuff, which was in a sense chaotic itself because now they're wondering who is he. They ended up finding me a plastic surgeon. They asked for insurance. Of course, I didn't have insurance. I took all the money that I had in my purse and it was like, here, here's this money, sew my face back together. They ended up putting me under, they sewed my face and my ear back. When I woke up, I had contacts in, so my eyes were burning because they used latex gloves to take out my contacts in order to sew up everything. After Angelica was dismissed, she moved into one of the Arizona properties her pimp owned while she recovered. One of the girls that used to work for the same household that I was at um, ended up coming back just mm. because she had respect for me. And she was like, don't worry about nothing. I'll take care of all the bills. When you're back on your feet, I'm leaving again. And I'm like, okay, I, I have to honor and respect that. You have no idea who the guy was? No. And I don't like white vans, especially if they got ladders on top. And you have no idea, like, why this happened to you? Mm -mm. I decided I can't do this anymore. 
and stuff. I almost lost my life for no reason and stuff, so I gotta go. So I had told my, my pimp that I was coming to Chicago to celebrate my birthday, and I never came back. Hmm. Angelica came back to Chicago in August of 2005. Again, she was on the run, this time from a very different pursuer. So um, the pimp ended up leaving his girls and stuff on the West Coast and coming to Chicago to try to find me for three months. I stayed in hiding. Why was he trying to find you? Because he wanted me to come back. I had made a lot of money, a lot of money. You calculate six houses that are over worth $250,000 a piece. Yeah. You're looking at well over a million dollars in just houses. Um, how did you know that uh, this pimp was looking for you? I was told. Angelica bounced between hiding out at her dad's and friend's apartments, not staying anywhere too long. After a few months, she got word that the pimp had given up and gone back out west, so she settled at her dad's apartment. It was a one-bedroom apartment. Mm. You walked in, and it was a living room. Where did you sleep? So, okay, so this is going to sound really strange. (laughs) So when you walked in the door, it was a living room, and in the living room, there was... A, a sofa and a love seat and the refrigerator. So um, I ended up putting a bed in the kitchen area because there wow. was no stove. My father never cooked. He ate out or he microwaved. So that's why the refrigerator was already in the living room. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This does sound like a dad's house. <laughs> <laughs> when she was a kid, Angelica's dad had run a club on Chicago's west side. Now he worked at the Wellington Trunk and Case Factory having sold the club years before. He ended up selling the clubs thinking that if he sold the clubs and gave my mother the money, that she would come back to him. But instead, you know, she bought a house and did everything else. How do you know that's why he sold the club? Because he told me. And he he gave her the money? He gave the check to me to give to my mother. (sighs) Hmm? How did she react to getting the check? She's like, she took it. I'm telling you, Mom, if you could meet this woman, she would convince you to take off your clothes. Angelica turned 26 in September. She got a job working for a company called Medicare Transportation. They used to um, transport elderly people from day programs. Soon Christmas was right around the corner. And I think that's when I saw, I saw my son again. As the holidays approached, Angelica decided to buy him a present. Her mother still wasn't letting her see Anthony, and she wasn't invited to the family gathering. But she figured she could get the gift to him through a relative. I don't know how I ended up finding out about the the toy that he wanted. I think one of my cousins and I were talking, and he told me about um, this game that he wanted and stuff, where it was the, a crocodile, and you would push the teeth down. And then um, if you picked the wrong tooth, the crocodile's mouth would close down on you. Christmas Day, the gift was wrapped and waiting. My aunt called me and said, hey, your son is here. Do you want to come over? So my father only lived a couple blocks away from my aunt. And I grabbed the gift and I took it over there. Sure enough, Anthony was there. Larger than she remembered, but her son nonetheless. So you had never talked to him at all prior to that day? No. What was it like to see him for the first time? It was different. Because I wanted to sit there and be like, oh, you're my son. You know, you want to say stuff, but then you're like, okay, maybe I need to just pull back and not, because I don't know what they've told him. I don't know if he even knows who I am. So my thing was, let's see if he figures out who I am and go from there. Angelica handed him the gift. Anthony was more interested in unwrapping it than finding out who'd given it to him. He said, how do you know my grandma? And I'm like, wow. um, I don't know how to explain it. I don't want to sit there and just say it. They started playing. We were playing the game and whatnot. Angelica's mother came over to watch. My son asked my mother, cause she was there too, um, who is she? 
and my mother re told him that's um, grandma's friend. And I'm like, that's not right. And my cousin even was like, no, you can't do that. It's not fair for him to be playing with her and stuff and not know exactly who she is. And you're telling him that it's a friend. The discussion went on like this until eventually Angelica's mom threw up her hands. She's like, okay, well, you tell him. So I told him, I was like, uh, I'm, not only am I your grandma's friend, but I'm your mom. And his first thing was, you're my mom? In a question formation. And I'm like, yeah, I'm your mom. And he gave me a hug and there was no questions asked. So I don't think my mom was expecting that. I think she was more expecting of him maybe having anger and animosity and having the questions, but he never did. He wanted to go back to playing. So then we kind of kind of talked a little bit and I'm like, you know, you're Puerto Rican and black. And he's like, I'm black. And I'm like, yeah, what the hell did you think you were? Mm -hmm. So he always knew that he was Puerto Rican because my mom's Puerto Rican, but he never knew that he was half black. So he was like, guess what? I'm Puerto Rican and black. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> he's like, like, right. You know, so people, good. the black, you know, black people in the community, like, you know, I can't avoid the fact that I'm black. I'm being followed in stores and stuff. And my son's like, fuck this, I'm black. <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay. So <laughs> he was all excited and I got to take pictures and stuff like that. I guess he was crying on their way, on their drive back to um, to Iowa. And she ended up calling me and telling me, this is exactly why I didn't want you to see him. Cause now I have to deal with him crying all the way back to Iowa. And I'm not sure if I saw him once or twice after that situation. And then there was no more communication until he turned 18. I used to write him, I had notebooks, and I would write him little letters. Angelica had no way of knowing if the letters ever got to Anthony. But some might have made it through. She did get one response. It was a handmade card, folded out of printer paper, that showed up at her aunt's house. In it, Anthony had written simply, I heart you. Inside the card were a collection of gifts. He gave me a Pokemon card, a penny, and drew a picture of me, his mom, my mom, and um, me. Anthony had signed the card with his name and his grandmother's. Instead of to mom, the card had been addressed to Angelica. Angelica continued to live with her dad. Things weren't always easy, but she was paying the bills. She started dating a guy named Smurf, who had a motorcycle and his own apartment. A few years went by. One day in November of 2010, Angelica was 30. She got a call from her cousin while at work. And um, she called me and was like, your dad doesn't look good and stuff. I'm, I'm trying to take him to the hospital to see what's going on with him. And stuff. I was like, oh, just tell him that you're going to take him to the China Buffet afterwards because that's all my father wanted to do was China Buffet. So he ended up getting in the car with her and they stopped at the hospital. He went in walking. Um, by that Wednesday, he was no longer able to speak and he started deteriorating after that. Um, I did call my brother. I gave him the courtesy call. That's what I call it because... Um, I, up to this day, I wish I would have never called them. I had just gotten off of work and was catching the bus to go see my father. And when I walked in, I stopped at the cafeteria. When I came out of the cafeteria, my mother was standing right there. So I was like, oh, hi. I didn't know that her and my brother had um, actually came to Chicago. Was Anthony there? No. Okay. When the awkward group got to the hospital room, Angelica's cousin and aunt were already there. Someone asked Angelica's dad if he could tell who had just arrived. 
So he put on his glasses and he was, you know, saying who it was. And he got to my mother and he's like, uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And then he tried to like lift up his head to kind of really see who it was. And he took off his glasses. He, somebody cleaned them and was giving them back to him. And my mom left the room. He couldn't identify my mother. By that time, I think they hadn't seen each other in 20 years or close to 20 years. So he recognized everyone else in the room. He recognized her. everybody else, but did not recognize her. We ended up going downstairs to the cafeteria and having a meeting in regards um, of the well-being of my father. Angelica wanted her dad to stay with her. I was going to quit my job and I wanted to take care of him. And my mother and my brother had one of my aunts convinced that, no, you can't take care of him. It's going to be too much. So they pretty much outvoted me to put him into a nursing home. So, um, I, of course, I left out of there pissed off. Because in the back of my mind is, how dare you guys come and tell me what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do when yo you guys never helped for shit. My brother would only see my father twice a year, pretty much. My father would go to Iowa, but my father never stayed at my brother's house. He stayed at a hotel while he was over there. Hmm. And then my aunt lived all the way up north, but was real buddy-buddy with my mom. And those years that I lived with my father, never saw her come visit him. So I'm like, now you guys want to come sit here and tell me what is going to happen with him. So I was pissed off. My mother and my brother took my father's set of keys to the apartment and they were like, oh, we're gonna help you clean the apartment or whatever. And I'm like, okay. I told them I had to do some errands that morning. When I pulled up to the house, they were already in the house and pretty much were already done. They had um, went through all my father's stuff. They threw away a whole bunch of his clothes. They were already counting him as he was already dead. My father in his drawer had um, a black box, a black case that had all his jewelry in it. Um, my father was very, very into his jewelry. Her dad even had a guy named Nacho who would customize his pieces. There was a heavy gold chain, a Movado watch engraved with his initials, lots of rings. He had a a rooster charm. Which her dad had been slowly filling in with precious stones. So eventually that whole piece was going to be nothing but diamonds, rubies, and sapphires to make up the whole rooster. My brother and my mother said that they were taking the jewelry to my aunt's house where it would be in safekeeping. Six hours later, um, I got a phone call from my brother. He specifically told me, I have our dad's jewelry and I don't give a fuck what you say. So they never took it to my aunts. They took it back to Iowa with him. Even after my father passed away, they never gave me a piece of his jewelry. They were looking for paperwork as far as like if my father had a will. And I, I really believe that's what they were looking for originally. My father didn't have a will but he had um, his pension papers. I knew exactly where the pension papers were. I grabbed them real quick, because they were in the front room. I grabbed them and put them into the kitchen area and locked the kitchen area, because that's my room. You don't have no business in there. So because they don't have those documents, they don't know where to find the pension or anything else, so you're not getting a single dime. I'm, I'm still an ass when it comes to that. Angelica's dad was moved to the nursing home. 
Smurf, the guy Angelica was dating, started crashing at her dad's apartment with her. And um, he's the one that was at the home with me when they gave me a call. Okay. The night before, Angelica, her aunt, and her cousin had gone to visit her father at the nursing home. And um, I had just told him, I was like, you know, if my dad passes away, I have nobody. And my aunt was like, you have us. And I was like, yeah, but I still don't have nobody because I don't talk to nobody. So that night I left. I ended up going home and Smurf was there. And um, the next morning I was supposed to get up early to go see my father. I ended up waking up late. I was like, let me eat something. I'm going to head over to the hospital. By the time my food got done out of the microwave, I was getting a phone call to say that my father had spiked a fever and that they did everything that they could possibly do, that I needed to come down there and identify him. Smurf took me to the hospital where my father was at, and um, I had to go upstairs, and they had already had the curtains closed and stuff like that. And I had to make the phone call to my aunt and my cousin. So my father passed away in December. My mother didn't show up for the funeral. Neither one of my brothers was there for the funeral. Um, I picked out my father's outfit. I took it to the funeral home. I chose to have him cremated because it was going to be more cost effective. Um, they ended up coming for the weekend and leaving before my father's funeral even came. And that was it. I haven't talked to my mother or my brother since then. So it's going on eight years, eight or going on nine years. When the funeral was finally over, reality slowly started to sink in. I couldn't afford the rent, so I had to pack up everything. Angelica spent some nights at Smurf's place, others with friends. One day in the summer of 2011, Angelica and Smurf had plans to meet up. He was supposed to swing by on his bike and pick her up, but he didn't show. I was waiting for him in front of his mom's house and um, calling him, calling him. He wasn't answering his phone. All of a sudden, from down the block, Angelica saw Smurf's brother running towards her. I'm like, what the heck is his brother running for? Like, his brother's going nuts or whatever. His mom came running out. She's like, have you talked to him? Did you talk to him? And I'm like, no, I'm waiting for him. She's like, he had an accident. We got to go. On his way to meet Angelica, Smurf had lost control of his bike. The three raced to the scene. His shoe was there and there was blood. The motorcycle was a couple poles down from where his shoe was. We went to Cook County Hospital. They ended up putting me and his mom into a room and came out and told us that pretty much they couldn't do anything for him that he had passed. He ended up um, passing away on Central Park and Lake while I waited for him in front of his mom's house. She broke down and I don't know where I was running to, but I ended up running out of the room and out of the hospital. I ended up going back there to see him and he only had like two cuts on him, like small abrasions, one on his forehead and one on his cheek. I had just lost my father in December and now I'm losing Smurf in July. So then um, uh, I couldn't sleep for three days. They ended up giving me um, a pill that forced me to go to sleep. At the funeral, Angelica was withdrawn. I, I didn't want to go up there to see him. I stayed in the back 
So at the very end, I ended up seeing him and it was like so quick. I, I didn't even want to make direct eye contact and stuff with Smurf's body because I'm already traumatized from the last funeral. After my father had passed away, I, I do want to say this. After my father passed away, I did attempt to um, commit suicide by um, overdosing on pills. And Smurf is the one who found me in the bathtub. After that happened and Smurf found you, mm -hmm. um, and then he passed mm -hmm. shortly after, obviously that must have been like a double punch. Like, where is your kind of... I was already stayed numb. ...stayed at? You were numb? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angelica moved in with some friends. The next few months were bleak. A couple months after that, I ended up meeting a guy and I, you know, I told him, I was like, hey, look, I'm not really looking for a relationship. I just, you know, want that female male company and stuff. And um, I ended up pregnant. Angelica's daughter, Strawberry, is now six. But at the time she was conceived, Angelica was only a few months into grieving the loss of Smurf. And I was terrified to tell Smurf's family because I was still, you know, well connected with them and still going over there and stuff like that. Angelica had gone through her first birth alone. She'd had to drive herself to the hospital the first time. So um, I finally ended up telling them and stuff. And they were happy for me and stuff. Up to this day, my daughter calls uh, Smurf's mom, Grandma Clee. The baby was expected in July of 2012. As her due date got closer, a new fear started popping into Angelica's head. You know, DCFS, you could count, call from anywhere. If you have a suspicion, you can make a hotline call. You know what I'm saying? This woman is going to find out. And when she finds out, she's going to call DCFS on me and stuff. And she's going to take this child away from me. And she's going to punish this child like she punished me with my other child. That was my biggest, biggest, biggest fear to the point where I had made a living will. I have a document stating that if anything was to ever happen to me, my mother is not allowed to have anything to do with my child. Oh, my God. So then I got strawberry. The new family began discovering life together. Angelica was still crashing on her friend's couch in exchange for a portion of the rent. She'd quit her job when her dad got sick and was living off of public aid. And there was a lot of other things about the situation that were less than ideal. Their arguments start getting irritating. Mm. You know, they argued about why did you have six cigarettes and I got seven. They mm. argued about who was rolling up the weed. They argued about her wanting to go out and he wanting to stay at the home or her not cooking and him not having a job but going out and trying to find little jobs here and there. Since she was often home with her newborn, her friends regularly started asking her to babysit their kids too. So, I'm like, okay, so then me not having no money, then I was stealing. So I would steal from stores, from like um, Menards. I'd take deadbolts hmm. and stuff, and or padlocks, and they'd give me in-store credit. You'd like return it or mm -hmm. something? Okay. So with that in-store credit, I would get toilet paper, paper towels, um, hmm. soaps, stuff like that. And that's how I survived. Then as it had so many times before, the bottom fell out from beneath her. One month, Angelica was short on rent. She worked out a plan with her roommates to pay them back as soon as her next benefit payment came through. They agreed to cover her share. But then her roommates decided to get a bunch of drugs on credit. They had got some marijuana fronted to them in hopes that I would get my, my money that I would give to them for rent and they could pay their debt. And when that day came in, I didn't have, my money didn't get deposited into my EBT card. There was some sort of error with the deposit. Angelica would have to wait another 24 hours, but her roommates weren't willing to. The message was, you better figure out something. And I, it took me, mentally it took me back like, oh, are you trying to say, because you know, people knew my history and stuff. So I'm like, oh, so are you trying to say I better go sell some 
ass and stuff to give you your money because you guys chose to get weed on credit. Angelica wanted to give her daughter a stable life. She knew she needed help from people she could trust. And she was determined to improve her situation, even if it meant starting at the bottom all over again. At that point, I decided, okay, I'm going to pack up my stuff. I'm going to put it in storage. and I'm going to do whatever I got to do. For the first time in her life, Angelica chose to be homeless. Next time on the final episode of Where I Stay. The reconstruction will begin. Where I Stay is produced by Rivet and Streetwise. The show is hosted, reported, and produced by Jesse Batend. Streetwise is a weekly street publication that provides immediate income and employment opportunities to those experiencing homelessness. For more in-depth reporting and coverage, check out streetwise.org. If you enjoyed this show, there's a few things we'd ask of you. First, tell someone that, that you enjoyed it. Second, please leave us a rating or a review on iTunes. It's one of the most crucial things when it comes to helping us spread the word. You can also learn more about Streetwise's mission at streetwise.org. And if you'd like to help support this kind of work, it's easier than ever. Text Streetwise, all one word, to 243725. Or visit streetwise.org for more information. Special thanks to Angelica and everyone who spoke with me for this project. Our theme song is The Deconstruction by Eels. Check out their new album, Earth to Dora, wherever you get your music these days. For more about Angelica, the show, and in-depth reporting about the issues discussed, follow Streetwise on social media, or just pick up a copy. Once again, you can make a difference in the life of someone experiencing homelessness by texting STREETWISE to 243725. You can also find that link in the show notes. Until next time, I'm Jesse Patend. Thank you for listening. <laughs>